thank you all very much for attending. It's great to have an international audience here today as well. Um, as Emma said, this is the second session in two sessions on grant writing, and it's a bit more practical than the first one and more focused. We're going to be look at, looking at how you evidence your track record, and in particular in relation to narrative CVs, and something called the Resume for Research and Innovation, which is um, a new way of evidencing track records that's come out of the UKRI in the UK, but it is also used by many other funders as well. Um, could you move on, please, Emma? So in case you weren't at the first session, um, my name is Jacqueline Aldridge, and I've been providing research funding support for academics across a whole range of disciplines for over 20 years now. Um, and I've worked on multiple different schemes, in, and I've got quite a lot of experience with early career researchers as well, who are obviously learning the um, craft of grant writing, which is very different from any other form of academic writing. And that's something I covered in the first session uh, of these two. Um, if you could move on, please. Um, and I thought I'd just do a very quick overview of the first session, because if you were there, I don't want to be um, you know, making you listen to the same stuff all over again. And there is a video online. And at certain points, I do cross reference across if there's more information that might be useful for you. So the first session was a broad introduction to grant writing. Um, and that covered choosing which funder you're going to target, how to plan a research funding bid, and then how to write the proposal itself and the links um, are there below. Um, and I expand on certain elements of that in this talk um, and also reference the earlier talk as well. So you, know, you might want to go back and have a look at some of those other resources that are available. Um, next one, please. So an overview of this particular session, we end with a practical session on how you actually build your own narrative CV. We'll be giving you some exercises to follow with that. Uh, but actually, it's a much broader question than that. In order to create a great resume or CV, you actually need a fundable team to start with. And I'll spend a few minutes talking about how you assemble the right team for a particular project. Then you need to work out how to evidence your track record and the best way of communicating to your reviewers that you're an excellent researcher with the right competencies to run this particular grant. Um, and then creating a narrative CV, which is often uh, something that has to be done on a group basis, so they can be individual as well. There's a whole process of negotiation, crafting, a lot of logistics, and we're looking at that process as well, because unlike a CV, you don't just tweak what you've got already. You have to create it from start. So one of the objectives of this session is that you come away with the broad outline of an R4RI um, and the elements you'll put in it. Because uh, it is quite time consuming. If you're very bogged down in writing a proposal, um, you may not build in enough time and space to actually write your R4RI. So this is going to give you something that is there on the side, is going to really speed you up when you're in the last two weeks of writing this grant, you suddenly realise you've forgotten uh, to start preparing the annexes because you've been so busy crafting the proposal. So um, it's going to be quite sequential. Um, although the focus is on the UKRI's um, particular R4I template, it will be relevant to a whole range of different funding agencies as well. So don't worry if you don't think that's going to be your target funder. There are lots of other agencies that are using this narrative format as well. So if you could move on to the next one, please, Emma. So the first part of this talk is how you create a fundable research team. And it's one of those things that might seem startlingly obvious that your research team needs to be really excellent. Uh, but sometimes investigators forget this. Um, and actually, if you look at the guidance for schemes, it's often talking about the project with just a mention of the team. But of course, unless the team is strong enough, you're never going to win the, um, the funding bid. Um, and in fact, the research team is the only known quantity in the proposal because everything else is speculative. Um, if you could move on, please, Emma. Yeah, so the team is your one certainty for a project. Uh, unlike a journal article, a funding proposal is exactly that. It's a proposal. 
you're saying what you're going to do. You're making a series of promises. And those promises are backed up by evidence um, and they're going to be very convincing. But still, it's a promise. It's a very speculative process. And the funding agency is going to make a big investment in your research. So they really need to know that you and the people you're working with are strong because the outcome is unknown and there are going to be risks to delivery. But something you can do in the proposal is evidence the track record of you and your research team. Because it's not a given that the reviewers will know much about you or even anything about you at all. So it's woven through every element of the proposal is who you are, what your skills are, um, and what your competencies are. Uh, next slide, please. So the relationship of the research team and the funding bid is completely crucial. Um, and nothing I advise in the second half of this talk is going to help if your team's not appropriate for the bidding question or strong enough. You know, and, and funding bids come in all shapes and sizes. Some are designed for early career researchers, with people with developing track records. Some are designed for very advanced researchers. It's not always made clear in the guidance, um, but you need to make sure that that fit is correct. And that's something we cover quite extensively in the first session. So you may want to go back and have a look at that. Um, so the strength of your team is an absolutely key part of the assessment. And it's not confined to the CV and the r 4 ri It has to be woven through the whole bid. And the bid's not going to be reviewed blind. The assessors know exactly who you all are. Um, and if they don't know, they'll want to find out. And they are going to consider your competence when awarding the grant. The team's also quite a major project resource. Um, you know, lots of the UK and European schemes fund your time. So if you've got a team of... 10 people on the bid or even five people and I'm working one on the moment with 26 people on it's going to cost possibly hundreds of thousands of pounds to fund your group to deliver a project over three years so the assessors really need to know whether the group you put forward or a part of is value for money and excellence is always the key, key criterion for funding bids you know, no funder wants to do anything and support excellent research, even for the very earliest career schemes. You have to show that you are excellent at what you do and for your career stage. And unfortunately, funding agencies don't exist to provide struggling academics with a helping hand. EDI considerations are always acknowledged and they are really important as well when you're putting your bid together. And some funding schemes like um, the Royal Society's Dorothy Hodgkin Fellowship actually caters for that. And plenty of funding schemes allow for things like maternity leaves. Um, and there is space to um, talk about these sorts of issues as well in the um, Resume for Research and Innovation, which will be the focus at the end of this session. Uh, but it's not, um, it, it doesn't replace excellence as a consideration. So whatever your circumstances have been, you have to show that you're really um, punching above your weight compared to other people at an equivalent career stage. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so in the previous session, I looked at the key elements of every fundable research project. Yeah, you and know, um, whatever the criteria, whatever the sort of scheme, if it's a research project, it's gonna have a question or a problem you address, methodology, sections on feasibility and risk. You have to say what your outcomes and outputs are and your budget and justification. The team is part of that. It's absolutely central to the design. So you can't sort of get together a team and then match it, that team to any design. You have to show that the people working on the project are absolutely key to delivering the project. There isn't a lot of overlap or redundancy in who you're working with. Um, so it's not the place to be kind to your struggling colleagues or to just even bring in sort of superstars who sprinkle a little bit of fairy dust over your project. You need to make sure that everyone has a really distinct contribution to the project. Um, and that's why meant the team has to be woven through everything. So for instance, in your methodology section, you will say, who is associated with each work programme. 
at the end of your motivation background section, you might have something on why you've assembled a particular scheme. In feasibility and risk management, you might be saying that um, you know three members of your team have already delivered successful projects in this area or, or have worked with a particular tool or, or group of participants. Um, you know, the outcomes and outputs. If you're saying you've published, you're going to publish nature papers, it's quite useful if someone on the team's already done that. Um, and again, the budget and justification, it's a well-planned budget and well justified. That some, says something about your competence as a team. So the team is really in, underpins the entire project. Um, so it's really important not to think just in terms of your CV or your R4RI when you are um, you know, looking at how you evidence your own competence. Uh, next slide, please. In the previous session, um, I introduced the concept of four underlying evaluation criteria. Scheme guidance varies and it can be very detailed, very nuanced. It can sometimes not state the obvious, but every single project asks an important and relevant question and the assessors will be looking at that. It needs to show a high chance of successful delivery because the funding agency is gonna be making a very large investment in this project and really wants to think it's gonna be um, successful. Um, and competence is key as well. So again, as well as in the design, in the evaluation, your competence will be absolutely key. And it needs to know that the investment is going to be excellent value. And all these things relate back to some aspect of the teams. The next slide, please. The important relevant questions. Uh, is this team asking an important question or are they asking something that is just relevant to their particular subfield and might be a contribution to the literature of their particular field? No funding agency um, is interested in just contributing to a narrow literature. Even if it's a blue sky funder like the European Research Council or the Leverhulme Trust in the UK, um, you know, the question has to be important outside a particular discipline. Uh, and, and the team has to show the capacity to do that. Um, in terms of delivery, you will need to show evidence that your team is likely to be able to pull this project off. Uh, previous project management skills, uh, you know, managing finances, leadership, successful collaboration, all feed in to whether you can deliver the project. And in terms of competence, are you all excellent researchers in your field? Is this evidenced by your publication track record, which will vary according to uh, the discipline and your career stage? But usually most funding agencies um, are not interested in funding researcher who simply has a PhD. Once you get into sort of postdoctoral research, you need a publication track record as well. And that's something when I'm working with really early career researchers, we might look at your publications alongside um, your funding potential. And sometimes, even though I'm always very keen and someone like Emmy, who's here, will also be very keen to encourage you to apply for grants. Sometimes it's just best to wait for a year or two until you've got a few more publications under your, your belt, because that process of peer review shows that your outputs have been recognized by other researchers. Um, and then in terms of investments, is your team worth the money you're asking for? So if you're asking for 25% of 10 people's time uh, to run quite a small project, uh, there might be some question marks over that. Equally, if you're only asking 1% of one person's time to run an enormous project, um, there'll be question marks over that as well. So the budget justification will also support your choice of team. Um, and there are, so there are lots of places in the application where you will be covering off this sort of information. Uh, yeah, to say the budget justification will mention the team members, how much time they're devoting to the project, what tasks they will undertake, the description of the work programs, will say what you're all going to do, uh, when and how. Um, you know, the summary will mention you. Uh, as well as the CVs and all the R4RI. So it is a, 
a very broad case that you make across the whole application. Uh, next slide, please. So with that in mind, you need to assemble a fundable team. Um, and I suggest you do that once you've got your idea fixed a little, um, if you're the, the principal applicant. Uh, sole applicant bids are increasingly rare, uh, you know, apart from some fellowship schemes. And even then, you'll probably have mentors or advisors on the scheme. Um, and the types of collaborator and partner who are permissible vary between schemes as well. So one thing you want to avoid is working with a group of colleagues coming up with a great idea that say four or five of you are already intellectually invested in, and then finding actually that none of the available schemes support your group, because perhaps one's in a different country and isn't fundable. Um, there might be other limitations in terms of what disciplines are funded. Or you might find that you know one member of your team is really keen, but just doesn't have any application, uh, any publications to their name. Um, and it's really hard, you know, once you've researched what is required by the bid to eject someone from a team. Obviously, that's, you know, it's unethical and it's nearly impossible. So you want to make sure that at an early stage, you know what is expected from a fundable team. And then you put your team together around that. Um, and every member of this group you put together must have complementary skills. So this is not a time to hide behind each other. You, you don't want someone who does exactly the same thing as you at the same level. That will be considered a waste. You want someone who's doing something a bit different or works in a different institution. I mean, most schemes are really flexible about who you can work with, at least within you know, the country of the funding agency. But if you look at what has been funded. And that's quite a useful thing to do. It's something that I cover in the previous um, presentation. You, you can see what a typical team looks like for a particular scheme. And often they come from different institutions, not necessarily different disciplinary backgrounds, but there has been um, some process of selection to make sure that that team is optimized. It's not just a group of people who you know have coffee together every morning and always like working together. Uh, there's a bit more ambition and breadth in the choice of team. Um, as I've mentioned before, you're gonna check your eligibility requirements before you build the team and you're not gonna to commit too early. However, don't forget EDI issues. I mentioned those before, but um, a team of 10, white male senior academics is not great optics nowadays and probably is not going to be the great the greatest piece of research either um that would always be looked at very closely you know you need a range of researchers and lots of schemes do emphasize that they want an early career researcher in there so actually as a team as a group of early career researchers you should be in demand by principal investigators or other bids who want to bring you in to their team However, even as that, you might um, do your own due diligence before you accept an invitation to make sure that uh, you know, the team you're working with is sufficiently strong. Um, next slide, please. Um, I put this checklist together because I thought this might be helpful in um, auditing um, a team before you go ahead. Um, commit to each other and start writing your proposal. So collectively, and to varying degrees, you all need to show the capacity to generate rigorous academic knowledge, which is evidenced in your publication track record or whatever form of publication is used in your discipline. You need to have the capacity to ask and answer important questions. Again, that's evidenced through your PhD thesis um, and your publications, your conference presentations. You need relevant methodological skills and expertise for this particular project. You might be bringing in people who complement your own skills. Um, there might be experience with relevant populations, user groups, other stakeholders. Uh, if you're working with um, a particular sort of clinical population or you know, patient user group, um, you, know, you need to show the capacity to work with those particular groups. Again, your publication track record will show that you can disseminate knowledge successfully with the right sorts of audience. And increasingly with schemes, 
there will be, you know, the need to support research and development or an EDI action plan. If there's any form of some networking or career development or, you know, a doctoral training uh, bid, uh, that's going to be really important. You're almost certainly going to have to be able to show how you can meet ethical or data management challenges. Those will be sections of every funding proposal. And you might need some relevant non-academic skills as well. If you're running a project internationally, you need to show that you can communicate um, in those countries as well. And finally, just simple things, staff, project and financial management. And they may not come from within academia. You may have other experience that you bring to the ground. Um, and you need to show an appropriate funding track record. Some schemes are designed for people's first grant, but others, even if they don't say so explicitly, if you're looking at a multi-million pound grant, you probably need to have won some smaller grants first and successfully delivered them. So you don't want to waste your time um, overshooting um, and becoming too ambitious in your aims. It, you know, as Emma and people who are experienced in grant writing will tell you, it's very time consuming. Rejection is very much part of the process. And so you need to be very strategic in, in, in what bids you go for and when. Um, and so your team needs to be appropriate for the scheme. Uh, next slide, please. So the next section, you put the team together, now you need to sit down collectively and work out how you're going to evidence your track record to prove that you're competent, that you're going to successfully deliver the grant, and that this is going to be an excellent value investment. Next slide. So, a big part of the proposal is justifying and selling your team. It's really key to the entire case of support. You're not going to win the grant if the team's not strong enough. There is nothing you can do in the writing process to mask the inadequacies of your team. And in addition, your reviewers, and we cover this in the first session, are not natural enthusiasts and cheerleaders for your work necessarily. They may bring respect and curiosity to the task, but equally, they may be indifferent or you know, in the worst case, there's sometimes some animosity or jealousy or ignorance. So don't consider your reviewers as a sort of neutral readership. That's not going to be the case. Um, and you will need to provide evidence that you are capable of answering this particular question. And in terms of the reviewers, that might be, be particularly salient if you are asking and answering a question that's also asked by another discipline that uses very different methods. They may address the same topics as you, um, but they need to know that actually what you do is relevant and complementary. So your, your proposal and your CV will demonstrate all that. And actually, if your case for support does a really good job in justifying what you do and what you bring to the task, your CVs and your offer I may not even be read that closely it may just be a, a glance a tick and moving it to one side so in that sense it's not even necessarily the most important part of justifying and evidencing your track record if the reviewers don't know you they're going to take a closer look uh, but don't think that the whole job of explaining how excellent you are how competent you are is confined to that section of the application uh, next slide. So there are a number of ways that your track record can be evidenced. And the one we're all familiar with is the very traditional research funding CV uh, that you upload to an application and might be two or three pages long. Um, it's not quite the same CV as you use for your job applications. Uh, but it's not that much different. You can probably edit your job CV, take out the teaching, um, you know, some you know, less relevant information, um, and you focus on your individual research achievements. And they tend to be you know, your grants, your publications, uh, editing roles, things like that. Yeah, you know, some of the information is the same, but it's your your traditional scholarly achievements. Um, and one of the great things about the research funding CV is that you just update it 
for the next uh, bid or you know, swap the information in and out that's relevant, especially as you become more senior. Um, and funders may have specific templates or formatting requirements, but really it's a job that's going to take you a couple of hours to create a decent CV to a pen to a bid. However, and this is the point of this particular talk, there is now a move towards a more narrative approach to evidencing track records. And this is often a collective narrative approach. So European Research Council and UKRI are examples of this. Uh, next slide, please. So the new track record formats, which are proliferating, I've put a couple of links in for some of the other ones. We're going to be looking at UKRI today because that's the one that's most relevant to most of you. But the European Research Council now has a hybrid of CV and a narrative track record, which is very well established. And the Royal Society has been using a resume for researchers for a long time. There's a couple of links there. I'm not going to go into any detail about them, but they're there um, if you'd like to have a look afterwards. Next slide, please. So the um, UKRI's resume for research and innovation, um, it's only been around for about a year. Everyone's still getting to grips with it. It's a narrative team CV, um, usually only with about a thousand words. It varies from scheme to scheme, but a thousand seems to be typical. Um, and then you do have the option of 500 words for personal circumstances. That would be, you know, a career break, uh, you know, for maternity leaves or ill health. Um, perhaps if you've got, you know, a portfolio career or you left academia for several years. So that would show, you know, any breaks in your track record or anything that's say typical. But I've not worked on one so far that's needed to use that additional 500 words. Um, and within the thousand words, you've got to include all team members on the project who would normally submit a CV. So what's called the leads, the principal investigator and the co-leads, the co-investigators. But it can also include project partners and what are called professional enabling staff as well. The, the professional support people will also be working on the project if it's funded. So there's a lot to cram in. Um, it's something you'll write offline, but then it's a digital upload rather than an attachment. So something we've all found out when we are moving from a Word document to the online form is that there might be some reformatting to do. So you're going to have to build in a bit more time to cut and paste it, get it on the form, uh, and then make sure it looks sleek and the formatting doesn't go awry. Um, and the R4RI has four subheadings which are called modules. There's a link to the guidance there, but um, I think we'll find them on the next slide. So the four modules, one is the contributions to the generation of new ideas, tools, methodologies, or knowledge. As I discussed in the um, previous session, UKRI guidance is often seems to be written by committee. So it's quite um, it, it's quite wordy, and sometimes you can be quite hard to understand exactly what is meant um, by these headings. But um, I'm going to come on to that later. But you know, very very crudely, that's where your publications will go. Um, module two is an interesting one because it's how you develop other people um, and collaborate effectively. So again, you know, if you're involved on big funding bids, big projects, big networks like this, that's some evidence you will use. Um, module three is your contributions to the wider in research and innovation community. So things you do within your discipline, you know, are you reviewing, editing, um, running sessions like this for you know, researchers in your community? And then module four, you know, contributions outside academia. You know, how are you engaging with users and um, ensuring impact? So these are four levels of uh, of your experience that um, come together to form your track record. Uh, next slide, please. So this is a really different emphasis to the traditional CV, which is quite linear, quite scholarly, not particularly contextualized. It's your grants, it's your publications, it's your service to the discipline. This requires a narrative. 
and it's a different emphasis to the narrative. So I think the key word for module one is contribution. You know, what knowledge have you contrib contributed? Uh, model two, module two is all about collaboration, how well you work with other people. Model three is about your citizenship um, within the discipline. And module four is about how you exist within the wider community. And actually, the fact that there's four C's is completely coincidental. Uh, just the words I picked out. There was no, um, uh, I wasn't trying to be cute in doing that. But it's quite useful, I think, as you're working to keep those in mind. Um, next slide, please. I don't know if you're familiar with this. It's the um, VTI Research and Development Framework. Um, it's something that's, it's it's a UK uh, mechanism. It's a way of looking at how you develop it as a researcher. And actually, I, I thought I'd put this on one of the slides because I think it shows mo more overlap with the R4RI than, than a, you know, the traditional, um, traditional research funding CV. Uh, because it has this broader approach to what it is to being a successful researcher. So in here, you've got elements of you know, research management, working with people, um, you know, as well as your own knowledge base, uh, your ability to ensure engagement and impact. So you know, if you're someone who's been keeping a close eye on your career, within this framework, you may find that the R4RI actually suits you really well. And actually you've built up a reasonable evidence base already. So that can be very encouraging for some people. Next slide. Uh, so you know, the R4RI has a set of advantages for particular researchers. So if you've had a portfolio career, if you've worked across industry, clinical settings, other forms of education, uh, you may find that actually you look a lot stronger in the R4RI context and also suits all round. It so, suits people who really do contribute to their community. Um, it allows the composition of the team itself to shine through because it's not just a series of CVs that the reviewers have to piece together. You create this narrative to say, you know, co-lead A will contribute this, whereas co-lead B will contribute that. You know, it shows a really tightly designed scheme. The R4RI is always customized to specific projects. So it's not just saying, I'm a superstar, give me the money. Um, it's showing that a particular team is has sort of bespoke ability to deliver against a very particular project. And it allows plenty of space for very adjacent experience and skills. Again, you might be able to bring in something you've done in your charitable work, in your work with industry, um, in your work uh, as a, in clinical context that really speaks to your ability to deliver this pro this grant with competence. Uh, and then there are also a series of disadvantages. Uh, and these are a mixture of logistics and structural issues. So if you've just got a co-lead who brings star value is on the grant for a tiny percentage of their time um, and you've brought on board as a bit of window dressing, I think that's going to shine through in the offer. All right. You know, this new system is intended to discourage just bringing people in to um, you know, make the grant look more impressive. It also highlights co-leads who aren't making a distinctive contribution. If you are working on your offer and you find that you know one person, it's really hard to find why they would fit in anywhere. That yeah, another member of the team always has better evidence to contribute than they do. Um, you've got a vulnerability that may um, you know may count against you in the review process. It's also a lot more work for the project lead and requires a lot of coordination. You can't leave this to the end of the process. In fact, you're at your startup meeting. I would recommend that you introduce people to the concept of the R4I and get them working on it already. The work count will always be the same, however big the team is. I've recently done one with 12 co-leads. That was quite hard work. I'm currently working on one with 26. It's really difficult. People are getting one or two mentions at most. And there's a lot of um, horse trading politics going on about you know, who goes where. 
um, even in the most collaborative um, and supportive of teams. You know, it is quite tricky to fit everyone in and show off their skills when you've only got a couple of places you can squeeze them in because you've only got a thousand words to play with. So that makes it much easier to miss out some really important critical information. You know, if your large team of co-leads all have a fantastic publication, you probably don't have room to mention them all. And you would have that room on a CV. Um, so you are going to need to also make sure your proposal itself works very hard to try and get that key information in. So if there isn't enough room for the really amazing publications of the team, make sure you cite them in the main proposal itself. You know, make sure things are brought into the justification for resources and the governance section. So you know, it does spread the load of selling the team across the whole proposal. Uh, next slide, please. I thought I'd put up a few extracts from the RFRI guidance, um, just so you can see this change in emphasis. There is a link on one of the previous slides, so you can just have a look at yourself, and I recommend you did. So in the first box I've put up, you'll notice the phrase, a selection of their past contributions. They don't want to hear everything you've done, um, and it's very linked to the proposed project. Um, and really, it's about balancing the whole team. And you can have complementary skills. So you might have one member of the team who has an amazing contribution to knowledge, another who's absolutely brilliant at the community aspects. That's fine. As long as everyone is in there um, to the appropriate level, it doesn't matter if one person is, you know, there's more focus on one person in a particular module. Um, and the second box, you know, a wider range of skills and experience, um, very linked to your capacity for this particular proposal. So you know, when you're choosing which publications to highlight, you'll probably choose the ones that relate to similar methods, skills, expertise or population groups. Uh, so it's not just about your sort of highest cited publication in this context. And happily, you can describe other relevant skills, such as experience, collaborations or teams, either within or outside academia. Um, so you need to get into the R4I mindset before uh, writing your first draft. Next slide, please. Uh, so there are really logistical differences between the traditional CV and the R4I. So the CV, you're going to create your own. It's a bit more flexible. You just retweak the bid for, you know, the CV for each bid. There's not much coordination across the team, apart from making sure everyone's using the right typeface, the right font size, the right margins, the right template. Uh, there's usually more word count and flexibility. And you provide your reviewers with a series of lists that they have to work through. They're not going to pay a lot of attention to each of the individual CVs. So the RFRI is a group effort. It's going to be more effortful um, because of the very set template. Any gaps in your track record are going to show. You'll have to craft it for scratch for each project. However, the exercises we're going to do um, in this session um, will give you an evidence base to work for and a starting point because a blank sheet of paper was always much difficult as that starting point. You know, if you've thought about which of your publications fit well, what evidence you might marshal into an RFRI, you, you accelerate your progress through it. Um, the project leads and you're going to need to project manage the process and it's going to have to be very restricted and concise. If there's a big team and they're quite experienced, you, know, you might find your first draft 2,000 words and then you have to work out how you cut it down to 1,000. And it tells a story to the reviewer. It's a narrative. And telling a story is always harder work than just producing a list. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, now we move on to actually how you create an R4RI that works for you and your project. And that's looking at what you do, where you do it, and how you do it. Um, so in order to have a, uh, an effective R4RI, you need to create a really cohesive narrative. And as with the funding proposal itself, 
We cover this in the previous session. You need to think about your reader, how much knowledge they come to the task with, um, how much time they've got, how much interest they've got. Um, think about what they don't know about you and your field. You're going to need to use interesting, relevant content. And that content is going to be really self-explanatory. You can't use any links. So you can't just put an acronym in there for a project and link it. You know, the only things you can link are actual sort of DOIs and references. Each claim you make about your competence does have to be evidence, though. So there's a real exercise in being concise as well as being interesting. And you have to make sure that each team member is fully and appropriately mentioned across the final draft. There's something I do when I've got a final draft, I use the, fi the finder function and then search for either initials or surnames, however we're working it, just to see how many mentions each one of them's got and make sure it's broadly equivalent. And one person is going to need to own this. Um, you know, you need one voice and one person who can check and prove the final version. Because when you send it out to your team members to look at, they're all going to add bits and pieces about themselves. Um, you're going to end up potentially with a version control nightmare. They may not have read the guidance. You'll have to bring it back in, get it to word count and make sure that um, it looks professional. And there might be someone like Emmy or me who can help you with this, but uh, sometimes you will be on your own with it. So you need plenty of time. Um, you know, and with the final draft, you think, how is this going to look to the reader? So the way I would suggest approaching it is that you theme each of these four modules around one or two main key claims. Uh, you know, giving them about 250 words each. Um, you're going to collate the evidence for each claim and module across the entire team. So ask them. You know, what is your outstanding publication? What grants have you managed? You know, what service have you offered your discipline? And then you have to allocate the best evidence to each module, assuming that everyone's, you know, ensuring that everyone's appropriately represented. Um, and the guidance is very specific. Don't provide long lists of examples. No one's got time to plow through long lists, however impressive. Select a few and you know, put them in context as well. And as I said before, avoid meaningless acronyms or any information that your assessor isn't going to understand um, out of context. You have to be able to read it and think, yeah, this is a great team and you know, a group that we would like to fund. So what sorts of evidence might you use? Um, your academic publications are obvious examples and any other forms of dissemination that are common in your discipline, such as conference proceedings, uh, your previously funded projects and formal collaborations, any awards or prizes you've won, um, your service to your academic or your professional community. You know, I think actually PhD and postdoc su supervision is really important to use in an R4RI. Um, anything you've done in the field of consultancy, knowledge transfer, public engagement, policy work, that's all going to go in the fourth module, and relevant leadership and management or career development roles, including outside academia. I happen to know that Emma was a deputy head teacher in her previous life. That should be going in her R4RIs, because I think if you can be deputy head teacher of a primary school, you can certainly um, run a research grant. Um, and then you need to think about how you present your evidence, given that you've only got um, a thousand words to work with. So you um, might, you know, say that all if you've all done something, then say all team members have engaged with national policy communities through you know, the following and one or two examples. Um, you might uh, collate your on time completions with the PhD students, you know, one person may only have done one and someone might else have also done six, but if there's four of you and you've got 25 completions between you, you know, that looks good and that they've all gone on to have interesting academic positions. Um, you might put the combined value of previous uh, research projects, including, um, you know, a particular example. And then, you know, your involvement with uh, learned societies as well. So this builds up a picture um, of your competence while 
packing in the maximum amount of evidence in this very, very restricted format. So the, the R4I challenge is very much like a jigsaw puzzle. There's a lot of overlap between the modules, as you're going to find out shortly. Um, your writing's got to be very clear and concise. You've got to fit stuff together very precisely. Um, and, you know, you are going to make sure that everyone is represented. So, you, you know, you might have 10 examples of great publications um, across your, you know, team of three. And, and one person's only got one and it's not so strong, but it probably has to go in there. So you, know, you need to balance things out to make sure everyone's in there. Um, so it's very different to writing the CV and you will find it takes several iterations and there might be some politics um, to engage with as you work. Because it's so new and everyone was flailing a bit a year ago when they first had to engage with it, there is a lot of advice online. I've picked out three quite useful ones. I know Emma's developed, um, got a template that she's, I think, got from Cambridge uh, that she's shared with you. Um, but there is a lot out there and you might find that one of these sites really helps you. They're all worded really differently, um, but I found them quite useful when I was working on this presentation. So there's just three. I think I saw something on LinkedIn as well. There's someone, um, who's been using AI, has, tra has trained ChatGPT to um, write an R4RI for her. And she says it's not perfect, but it does a good first draft. So something to think about if you want to you know, avoid that uh, rabbit in the headlights face with a blank page. So and we now come on to the main part of the session, which is how you might build your own R4 or I, and I have um, a series of exercises that you get sort of 10 or 15 minutes uh, each on that help you understand how the challenge you know plays out in practice, both individually and collectively. I think Emma's going to put you in small breakout groups towards the end. Um, and also you're going to come out with a reformatted version of your CV under these headings with perhaps a couple of sentences that you can use when you submit your own narrative CV. Uh, so the way we're going to work at is first we're going to look at building an individual um, R4RI, which is going to be a compelling, a compelling narrative about your research track record uh, for a single applicant uh, bid. That's not particularly typical. Um, usually, um, applications are with at least a small group but there are examples where you have to rely just on your own track record and actually that's quite useful in this context because you're going to be building up this list of evidence that you can use and contribute to other R4Is as well so it's your sort of root bank of evidence. Um, there is a link here to the scheme we suggest you use for this EPSRC New Investigator Award um, it's probably relevant to quite a lot of you. However, if that doesn't work for you, you're not eligible to apply, then just keep it generic. Just look at the evidence you have that fits to the different narrative CV modules. Um, I've put a bit of guidance about EPSRC New Investigator. We're actually gonna share this set of slides in the chat with you so you can look at it as you um, work on the exercise and flick through it. Perhaps use some of the links if you want. Um, so I've highlighted a couple of elements. Um, and one is the recognition of alternative career paths and the diversity of career experiences. So that's something that would come out in your R4RI for this scheme. Um, also, you need to show that your previous experience don't duplicate the objectives of the new investigator scheme. So in this context, you need to contextualise previous grants you've held to show that they do not preclude you from applying to this particular scheme. Um, again, that's quite a useful um, skill to use when, um, you know, things like the future fellowship scheme um, that UKRI runs as well would also have this sort of requirement in it. Um, you can come back to this because it's going to be in the chat. So exercise one, um, 
sequentially, you're going to build your evidence against each module around specific claims that you determine yourself. And it'd be really good if, as, as you work, you consider the following. You know, does it seem that you've got evidence that could be used in several places? Um, if there were a team application, what's your really outstanding contribution? Which module do you align to best? Where will you be pushing for the PI to include your contribution? Does this scheme feel right for you? I mean, that's something you might find when you're working live. That actually, as you work on the R4RI, you think, mm, not sure that this scheme really does showcase my talents. Um, and do your strengths simply lie elsewhere? Also, you might find that actually you could do with building your track record in a particular area. I've just worked on a team R4RI when actually the team was brilliant at working with the community, but hadn't done a lot of contribution to the discipline. So we had to work a bit harder to make the case that they were very well embedded in their disciplinary communities. So we're suggesting 10 minutes to work on each module in turn, but actually we've got plenty of time so we can... It can take a bit longer than that. Um, perhaps we'll check in after 10 minutes and see if you want um, a bit longer. Um, and we'll reconvene to reflect after each 10 minute session. So you're not doing the whole thing at once. So the first one, um, if you sort of have your CV to hand, um, think about what your contributions are to the generations of new ideas, tools, methodologies, or knowledge. In terms of what that means, show that you're a really outstanding researcher for your career stage, that you've already published significant and appropriate publications, um, and that you've got really proven expertise in the techniques and methods you propose that show you are going to be able to generate the particular knowledge you need um, in uh, this particular scheme. So 